Yesterday, it was De'Aaron Fox versus Jalen Brunson. Today, it's DeMontis Sabonis versus Julius Randle, part two of our Locked on Kings, Locked on Knicks crossover debates. Who is the better player? And maybe a more important question, would the Sacramento Kings still have the same amount of offensive success if Randle were here instead of Sabonis? It's all right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked On Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all off season long. Today's episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA or enter promo code locked on NBA for a free white tech hat with any purchase. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We guarantee it. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports reporter and producer from ABC 10 News. If you missed yesterday's Locked on Kings, Locked on Knicks crossover, We debated De'Aaron Fox versus Jalen Brunson. And if you listen to that podcast, you know that for me, wasn't really much of a debate. For a lot of Kings fans, it's not really much of a debate. I think the vast majority of us, and I even believe the vast majority of just basketball fans who have no rooting interest in either the Kings or the New York Knicks, most of them would choose De'Aaron Fox over Jalen Brunson. I think the same can be said. In fact, it might be even more of a landslide landslide for DeMontis Sabonis versus Julius Randle. Maybe recency bias gets in the way. Maybe people uh, will allow themselves to be fooled by the takes coming out after Sabonis's performance in the uh, playoffs against the, the Golden State Warriors. But make no mistake about it, DeMontis Sabonis is a significantly better player than Julius Randle is, and he's certainly 10 times more important to the Sacramento Kings than I feel Julius Randle would ever be. But of course, everything is up for debate and Locked On Knicks is back. Gavin from Locked On Knicks joins me once again to discuss uh, Randall versus Sabonis. Also at the end of this conversation, we'll touch a little bit on just kind of the position that both the Sacramento Kings and the New York Knicks are in. Very similar positions really, and, and kind of on the same trajectory, despite being in two completely different conferences. Uh, so we'll discuss that a little bit too. Um, I actually, I like this Knicks team. I think they're going to be a fun team to follow, a fun team to pay attention to. Uh, I think Knicks fans should be also interested in just the Sacramento Kings and following them. Again, we'll discuss that at the end of the podcast, but I can still like and appreciate what the New York Knicks have without allowing myself to even consider the possibility of Julius Randle over DeMontis Sabonis. But here it is, my conversation with Locked On Knicks, our debate part two, Sabonis versus Randle. All right, it's finally time. This should be, maybe not from our perspective, but if either guy listens to it, this will be perceived as the heated part of the argument. Julius Randle against DeMontis Sabonis. Julius in the regular season, 25 points, 10 rebounds, 4 assists per game. Uh, Sabonis, 19 points, 12 boards, incredible numbers, seven assists per game. And DeMontis Sabonis had an effective field goal percentage that was a full nine points higher than Julius Randle's. Again, with that same context applied that um, him playing and and especially like even compared to Fox versus Brunson, not just the shooting around them, but the fact that Sabonis got to play center while Julius Randle, again, was, was stuck with Mitchell Robinson, ensuring that there were constantly two defenders around the rim. That is a big difference between the two, but that number really stood out to me. And I, I, I got to imagine um, on, on top of just how central each guy was respectively to their teams, Matt, that's going to be a big part of your case for Sabonis. Yeah, actually, before we get into that, Gavin, I was not aware of the fr- or the the dislike between Sabonis mm. and Julius Randle. So for the, the Locked on Kings audience, because I've never heard this or, or heard this brought up, like what was it about Sabonis' time in Indiana and Randle's time in New York that that created this kind of vitriol between the two of them i think that's the great part of it is that i legitimately have no idea but you could (laughs) you could see it every single time they played i think i think it was that sabonis is is as you know like very very chippy and julius is 
easily perturbed maybe would be the best way like a very very quick trigger on getting frustrated getting annoyed and like and this season look like he like it was a big emphasis from he talked about how he was doing breathing exercises doing meditation it, it, was, it was staying calm during games but if there's one player like julius could spend all off season at a tibetan monastery and demontis Sabonis would still be able to get his blood pressure going a little bit those two guys just Absolutely. I, I think it was maybe that they were kind of competing to be like the third best power forward in the NBA. Both wanted to move up a couple of rungs in the league. But they do not like each other. I'm sure each one thinks they're a lot better. There's just mutual disrespect there. Well, I guarantee you, Julius Randle has never stomped on DeMontis Sabonis' chest. So maybe Sabonis' yeah. sights have turned to... Moving uh, up. He has his NBA friendship rankings, and Julius <laughs> is like one spot higher. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And Draymond Green is is now yeah. uh, in that <laughs> spot. But I know Sabonis on the court versus Sabonis off the court are two completely different people. Um, but that fire on the court with Sabonis, the Sacramento Kings need for one and, and two, um, I think just makes him a better player. But... Having this conversation, like compared to Fox and Brunson, where again, I, I think the majority of people would would take Fox without hesitation. I don't see I I truly don't understand a world where anybody thinks Julius Randle is a better player than DeMontis Sabonis is. And I mean the 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 numbers back that up, the way they're used backs that up. Now, I will say this. If Julius Randle played every single game in his career, either against the Sacramento Kings or inside the Golden One Center, he'd be the greatest basketball player of all time. Because I don't know what it is about the Golden One Center and playing in Sacramento, but Julius Randle torches the Kings here. And this was (laughs) pre-Sabonis. He just, he torches the Sacramento Kings. He's put up unbelievable numbers in Sacramento. He's a lot of fun to watch. Um, I know Randle has his issues and has had his problems in the past, uh, but he was a player that when there were questions about if he'd be what his future was like in New York and if he'd be available or not. I was debating with, with some Kings fans that Randall would not be a bad option for the Kings to go out and get. Ultimately they made the better move uh, in, in finding Sabonis and not giving up Fox and, and the rest is history. But I mean, Demonta Sabonis, you look at the season that he had last season. I mean, the only player that compares to what he did granted this player is better than him and did better than him is the guy who should have been, the three straight time MVP and the guy who just won an NBA championship in Nikola Jokic. I mean, Sabonis dominated the league in double doubles. It was not close. He was second in the league in triple doubles also wasn't really close. Cause again, Jokic is unbelievable, but kind of like I was talking about earlier, DeMondis Sabonis is so essential to what the Sacramento Kings do and makes his teammates so much better at times. I think one of the areas where Randall might have a, a, a slight edge is that you could maybe count on Randall a little bit more to go and get you a bucket. And with Sabonis, at times you're just like, attack! <laughs> like, you're you're massive, you're strong, go! Uh, and, and Sabonis is always looking to kind of get his, uh, his teammates involved. Now, recency bias is a real thing, and I know a lot of people are going to think about how Sabonis was taken out of that that playoff series against the Golden State Warriors a bit. I think the Warriors are one of a few teams that can effectively do that. I was dead wrong about the Kevon Looney-Sabonis matchup. I thought Sabonis would dominate that matchup. He still had a, a solid playoff series in terms of the numbers, but the eye test would tell you this is not how good Sabonis was during the regular season, and the Kings need more out of him. So uh, to me, Sabonis is... a, a above and beyond the better player than Julius Randle, certainly the better player for the position that the Sacramento Kings are in. And I think that's really important too, is what does the team need out of those players? Um, But Julius Randle can be fun, man. I I just enjoy that Julius Randle fire sometimes. Yeah, I think I I think that's what makes the matchup so entertaining, at least to me. Um, I I think, again, a lot of it is context-based. I would be really fascinated to see what Julius Randle would do playing center in the Kings offense. I I think the, the offensive numbers would be pretty similarly historic and the defensive numbers might even be a little bit worse because Julius, like, even though I know Sabonis is not much of a rim protector, Julius in some ways, maybe even less equipped to play that role. Like, um, like not super long arms, not necessarily the quickest leaper on defense, though he can do that in spurts. Um, But, but where I I'm wondering again, if you, if you, if you just flip flop them, what would be really fascinating is Randall's the fact that he gets up so many threes, takes eight of them per game. Sabonis obviously is 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 good on them, but only shoots one per game. Um, Sabonis was only slightly more efficient at the rim, um, granted on much higher volume. But again, I think in a different context, that could be Julius Randall. Like like the single biggest thing 
damning his efficiency again is the presence of Mitchell Robinson. And, and in past years, I think Julius almost welcomed that and was pretty content to live on a diet of pretty hotly contested mid-range shots. This year, he was in the best shape of his career. He had the most dunks of his career. He was really explosive. I mean, the iconic play of his season maybe was just torching Jason Tatum off the dribble, getting to the rim, jamming at home. And the real shame for Julius is, is obviously he didn't get to have a healthy postseason. And I wonder, like, if I were going to make this argument, it would have been, well, Julius translated his regular season to production. And Sabonis didn't. And to me, like, it's kind of similar to Brunson versus Fox, where I agree with you, regular season, like, I think Sabonis was probably the better player in the postseason. I think Julius's game could have translated better because of that ability as a three level score because of the load he's asked to carry as a score where it gets maybe under discussed amongst Knicks fans because there's still kind of just mixed feelings out there about Julius. But at points, like especially when Jalen Brunson got hurt, he had to carry a Knicks team that was still doing pretty well. And he put up like monster numbers, stretches of a bunch of 30 point games in a row, games where he would hit seven, eight, nine threes in a single night. And he's able to do that, to your point, in a way, like if De'Aaron Fox went out, I just don't think DeMontis Sabonis could swing the same thing. Granted, maybe as a playmaker, he's doing similar stuff, and he's propping up someone like Kevin Herter to put up big stats. Rebounding-wise, they're very, very similar. Julius actually had better rate numbers in terms of offensive rebounding rate. Defensive rebounding rate, Sabonis obviously played at a faster rate, so the numbers were slightly better. Um, again, mixed feelings on Julius Randle, so... I'm okay with the argument that Sabonis is the better player. Maybe I'm not supposed to say that as the Knicks host at the end of the day. I, I guess my one question would be kind of going forward. Do you think those postseason concerns about Sabonis are, are fixable? Or is that something again against the wrong team that's always going to come up? I think it's absolutely fixable. Now, if if there was like a NBA metaverse type thing going on where the Kings and and, and uh, Knicks were playing the same team and they were down one with 10 seconds left, and you needed either a bucket from Sabonis or a bucket from Julius Randle. I think a lot of people would choose Julius Randle in that spot just because in terms of go get me a bucket, Randle is more of that guy. But for the other 47 minutes and 50 whatever seconds it is, 53 seconds, uh, that's where Sabonis is, I think, in, in, a, in an elite class of his own just because of how important and impactful he is across the board. Like you... In terms of like fixable, if DeMontis Sabonis takes and hits his mid-range elbow jumpers with confidence in that Golden State Warriors series, it completely takes away what the Warriors were doing. The Warriors were daring Sabonis to shoot. Kevon Looney was sagging off of him and just standing around the rim and standing just outside the paint so he wouldn't get a three-second violation and just saying, Sabonis, shoot that mid-range jumper. The Kings have given Sabonis the green light on that, and clearly... DeMontis just didn't look confident in that shot. He'd rather run his DHO game that the Kings made elite this past season. Um, so if, if Sabonis finds a way to knock down that shot and it's, I mean, it's a mid range elbow jumper is not a difficult shot, especially if they're leaving you that wide open. I think it solves a lot of those problems right then and there, but I want to go back to something that you said earlier. Like I, I disagree wholeheartedly that if you were to take Julius Randle and put him on the Sacramento Kings, that the Kings might still have the exact same offensive, uh, like historic offense. Yeah. I disagree almost com like completely like because of how much everybody on the floor benefits from playing through Sabonis and how the Sacramento Kings truly play through Sabonis. I mean, Sabonis opens up Kevin Herter's game. Sabonis opens up Keegan Murray's game. I would argue that, despite the fact that Fox and Sabonis are an excellent pairing, Sabonis does more for most of the other players on the roster than he does for De'Aaron, simply because De'Aaron can do it himself, right? But Keegan Murray's success, at times Harrison Barnes' success, like sometimes Malik Monk's success, like Sabonis is essential to what the the Kings do as a team, that DHO game that they played, the high pick and roll, a uh, high pick and pop game that they played to put together an offense that was the greatest in NBA history in terms of offensive rating. They averaged 120 points per game, had an offensive rating of 119. The Kings don't get anywhere close to that without DeMontis Sabonis. And if Julius Randle were in Sacramento, I think that would offensively kind of be fun at times. You'd see truly a five out offense where it's like everybody get away, get outside of the paint and whoever wants to attack attacks. Nobody would be in Julius Randall's way in that case. Uh, but 
defensively, I think that would be a colossal nightmare <laughs> that the Sacramento yeah. Kings would have. And, and Sabonis is not a great defender by any means. He's the defensive anchor for this team, and the Kings would like to have more rim protection, but it is what it is. He's your starting center. I think the Kings can overcome that just because of how good their offense is. But I don't think the Sacramento Kings would be nearly the same team or nearly as successful if it were Julius Randle here instead of Domas. Yeah, I think I think my only counter to that is that the Knicks were – Pretty incredible on offense themselves. 117 points per 100 possessions. One of the, this sounds weird to say, but one of the five best marks in the history of basketball. I think the Kings literally had the best mark in the history of basketball last year. And I think Julius, again, like where his season gets a little bit underrated is that he was the leading scorer on that team, like over, over Jalen Brunson. Like he was the guy who had to carry that load night in, night out. And he is a good passer. The issue is at times he's a slow processor. And mm -hmm. I think that's partially on Julius. Partially is that reads are very muddied, again, when you have a rim bound center, when you have a small forward who no one respects as a shooter. Um, and I wonder if playing in like that very open Kings offense, if some of those decisions could come a little bit quicker. And that did become a strength of Randall's last season that he or maybe strength is overstating it, but it's, it's an area he certainly improved. But I hear you and I, I admit you are. Far more the expert on how he ran it in terms of dribble handoffs. And I'm probably underrating when I'm talking about how good the King shooters are, how big of a role Sabonis had in making those guys good shooters and making great passes and, and setting them up um, to get quick releases off. Like I said at the top of the show, today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Why do you get close? Really, there's two main reasons. One, you want to look good, of course. And two... You want to be comfortable. Well, Bird Dogs is the best of both worlds. Their stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. You look your best, gents, but also it's not tight to the point of discomfort. You can move freely. You can use these shorts, whether you're just out and about casually. Uh, if you are like out doing something physical, if you're maybe uh, going for like maybe like a mild hike, if you're out golfing or whatever it may be, Bird Dogs is perfect for you. They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs fixed an issue or this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that honestly just looks exactly like khaki, but stretches. So you get way slimmer of a fit uh, throughout all of the shorts. Bird Dogs uses anti-stink sweat uh, wicking fabric too that keeps you cool and dry all day long. Go to birddogs.com slash locked on NBA or enter promo code locked on NBA for a free white tech hat with your purchase. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NBA or promo code locked on NBA for a free white tech hat. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We guarantee it. Real quick, Matt, before we finish up, because I think the Knicks and Kings are kind of fun, almost parallel versions of each other in different conferences. Um, two teams that were, were, were kind of the fun, like bright stories of, of the East and West last year. Uh, maybe maybe the Knicks got a little bit more hate just because of uh, uh, extra extracurricular stuff and, and and the markets that two teams are in and and the Kings I think were generally beloved last season which is which is awesome because I I grew up on those those Peja, uh Chris Weber teams and I'm I'm a fan as well um, but anyways that being said um, ton of continuity coming back a lot of success last year and and it's kind of an open question for both these teams like can they repeat that can they build on that or, or was it just catching lightning in a bottle and they're both going to come back to earth? How, how do you feel about the Kings heading into next season? I think you hit the nail on the head. I think these two teams are so comparable in so many ways. Now, ultimately what both these teams are trying to do is one establish themselves as last year wasn't a fluke and two take the next step into what Monty McNair Kings general manager calls like opening a championship window. Like ultimately, I don't do these teams have to compete for a championship next year or it's a failure? Absolutely not. Like, mm -hmm. especially some of the other teams that are in our respective conferences, like you have the Phoenix Suns in the West that are literally built to win a championship and that's it. You still have in the East the Milwaukee Bucks to contend with. The 76ers are trying to figure themselves out, but they have the reigning MVP. I mean, there are a lot of good teams at the top of both conferences that maybe that window is cracked, but it's just not quite open enough yet for these two teams. But when some of those teams drop, start to drop off, I think both franchises should expect that they're the ones that are taking that spot, that they're the, one that are, the ones that are moving into that conversation. And what we're setting up, Gavin, in reality, which we can try and speak into existence here, is we're setting up two teams that two years from now are pop, possibly hoping to meet each other in an NBA Finals. And if that were the case, like I think the Sacramento Kings have an overall better roster. I think they have overall better depth. I think they mm. fit more with each other. Um, they have less playoff experience than guys do in New York. And as we know, playoff experience matters a lot. And, and I think a lot of us in Sacramento are banking 
banking on the fact that now the Kings finally have a seven game series under their belt. They can learn from that and grow from that. Plus like this core has only been together now for still less than a calendar year. So what can they look like with, with a couple more years under their belt? Uh, and I'm sure there, there are some um, guys in New York that you're hoping to see their relationships blossom too as, as they get more comfortable with one another. But I think right now, like if you're, if you're looking at the next generation of exciting potential championship contenders, I think a lot of people think next generation and they look at the Victor Winbanyamas and they look at like the, the really, really young players. Those guys might be like two generations away because the Kings and Knicks are in that position where they're good now. They're hopefully great tomorrow. And when their opportunity comes, they're going to be in a position to make a swing. And at, at that point, that's really all you can ask for, right? Just make that swing, put yourself in a position to truly contend. Only one team can win every year, and it's really hard to do that. So if you don't end up accomplishing that, sure, it's disappointing, but sure, put yourself in a true position to compete. I think both these teams are setting themselves up nicely for that. Yeah, I, th I think it's fascinating in terms of like if, if you're, and, and again, we can we can we can do this later in the offseason, Matt. Like, which team has a better? future because I would I think I'd push back on on your depth point only because um I would still argue even though he didn't win the award Emmanuel quickly and he didn't play like in the postseason but Emmanuel quickly is probably the best bench player in the NBA put up all-star numbers when he got an opportunity to start last year uh, the Knicks played at a 57 win pace after getting Josh Hart he's back he made an incredible impact as a Hardenstein made a big leap down the stretch and RJ Barrett does pretty well when he gets to play with the bench unit but I think quickly success is kind of at the heart of like where the Knicks ceiling is at with this current team and that he's their third best player, like could quickly develop uh, no pun intended into their second best player. And yet you have a log jam between him and Jalen Brunson and, and seemingly a hesitancy to play those two guys together. And instead you kind of move down the rung if you're the Knicks and you look at someone like Quentin Grimes to make a big leap, which I think he's capable of, but I don't know if either, or I think, I think quickly does, but I don't know if Grimes is quite the ceiling of someone like a Keegan Murray, who, if you're looking at Sacramento and you're saying what has to happen for them to be a championship contender in two years, I would say like, well, Keegan Murray's turned into an all-star or a near all-star and they have a true three-headed monster and that's enough to get through the West. Maybe, um, I don't know if you want to make a final point on that or maybe that's a conversation for another day, but I think the Knicks maybe um, just because of their fit are a star acquisition away from truly ascending to that level, um, debatably. And I think the Kings could argue that they have the recipe in place. Again, I have some questions about Fox's shooting, Sabonis being your main rim protector, but the guys are there if Murray is truly on that trajectory that you could make it to the finals in two years. No, uh, to wrap up, I, I again, I think you're spot on. Like, I, I truly think you're spot on. Like, the, the Knicks still maybe need to make a big move. The Kings would always keep their mind open to a big move and could always probably improve either their starting shooting guard spot or their starting small forward spot. But they believe they already have their big three here with Keegan Murray being that third. And he still has to develop to show that, of course. But, like, you brought up a great point with Quickly. Like, it's, it's the, the comparisons with this team are ridiculous from the, the, the Quickly and Malik Monk standpoint, yeah. it's like maybe quickly is the ultimately the better bench player between those two. But Malik Monk is so essential to the Sacramento Kings team and what he does. And he's under a great contract and the Kings are going to have to worry about paying him at the end of this upcoming season. So like what's good, I, I haven't, haven't looked at the contract situations of the Knicks. So you can fill me in on this, but from the Sacramento perspective, what's good is with the exception of Monk, this entire core is basically under contract. In fact, you have under contract a minimum three years of this starting five being together. So the continuity is there. It's just now can the, the true success come with it and can you develop into a championship contender that can then turn into maybe a potential dynasty? Like that's best case scenario and it takes a lot to go right in order for the Kings to accomplish that. But I think the Kings and Knicks are in very similar boats in a lot of ways. The Kings do also play in the West, which historically is the better, more difficult conference. But I also say the top of the Eastern conference is as good as it gets. And to get there, you have to be damn good, even if you're not in the Western conference. So sometimes I think that is overused by people in the Western conference. I'll just say this, like, I think it's it's a good time to be a fan of both of those teams. And I think like every single year I have, I pick an Eastern Conference team, right, to root for and to follow. Um, and it changes every single year. I think the Knicks might be the pick this year for me. Wow. And I think for the New York Knicks fans, I think the Sacramento Kings should be the picks for them for their Western Conference team because these teams are expected to be amongst the most fun to watch with the highest upside 
not a lot on the line. Like there's, there are so many teams that have to succeed this year or it just all falls apart. The Kings and Knicks are not in that position. So you can enjoy this upcoming season where there are expectations and these two teams have to get better and want to get better, but there's a window for them to be good for a long time. And that's exciting. Yeah, there's been some Twitter angst between the two fan bases at points, but I'm I'm with you. I mean, there's two teams that were honestly like the respective laughing stocks of their conference for about 20 years running. And sure, the, the Knicks had one really good season in that stretch, and and the Kings like just had like their ascension recently, but pretty distinct parallels there. And the fact that like if we look back, even even as recently as a year ago, and said we'd be doing this podcast, we'd both be feeling pretty good. So we'll, we'll, we'll leave it to the fans to decide. De'Aaron Fox versus Jalen Brunson, Julius Randle versus Demontis Sabonis, but we can all take. Some solace in that the Knicks and Kings are in fantastic places, easy to root for, sustainably built. I sound like I'm pitching like a small, like organic farm right now, but um, <laughs> it's really, really exciting stuff going forward. Uh, Matt, before I, I let you go, um, just for just for the Knicks fans listening, can you uh, let everyone know where they can find uh, all your great work? If, if Knicks fans do want to adapt the Kings as or adopt the Kings as, as their team of choice. Well, come on over anytime, even if you uh, are not adopting the Kings and you're just trying to preview a Kings versus Knicks uh game the two times they meet and hopefully one of them is a national tv game next season but like what I, one of the things i always say is always listen to people and and to the other side because you'll learn a lot from the other side and how they perceive your side sometimes they might be wrong i'm sure i'm going to say things that Knicks fans are going to go you have no idea what the hell you're talking about but that's the sacramento perspective on what the team on the other side of the country mm-hmm. is doing and vice versa. So uh, I would encourage you to come on over. We have fun on Locked On Kings, just like I know you guys have Gavin and Alex on Locked On Knicks. Um, and we're enjoying the ride. Like last year for both of us was fun, right? It was just such vibes and excitement and look, look how much fun this is. Now this year, there's still fun, but there's expectations on top of it. So we'll both be kind of going down that river for the first time and trying to dodge the rocks in the way. But uh, ultimately, These are two very, very fun basketball teams to cover and uh, our fan bases and us as hosts, we've been waiting a long time to be able to cover a team in a positive way. So I can't wait. Yeah, me too, Matt. Um, and, and and same deal for any Kings fans who want to check out Locked on Knicks. Same places you can find Locked on Kings. Uh, we, we welcome you over to our side on the Eastern Conference until the two, until the two teams inevitably meet in the NBA Finals. Big thank you again to Gavin for not just suggesting the idea of these crossover episodes, but organizing it. I really had fun speaking with him. Like the the De'Aaron Fox conversation, my mind isn't even close to being swayed, isn't even close to being changed. If you gave me 100 opportunities to choose Fox over Brunson and Sabonis over Randall, I would choose Fox and Sabonis 100% of the time without hesitation. I don't know long-term if it's going to work or not. Maybe the New York Knicks have more success in the East than the Kings do in the West next season. Only time will tell, but I'm more than confident uh, with my trust and belief in in the Fox and Sabonis pairing going forward. Plus, like I said there, um, I think the Sacramento Kings have the better team. I think they have the better depth. Uh, and only time will tell uh, if both teams live up to their potential uh, or not. But either way, both franchises are in a really fun, really interesting spot. Uh, and I look forward to seeing how both of them perform come next season. You want to respond to what we talked about? Pick a side in this debate. I know Knicks fans are probably listening to want to weigh in. Kings fans, defend your guy. Or, hey, maybe cross over to the dark side a little bit and, and talk about Randall if you want to. You can do that on Twitter at Matt George Sack. You can email me Matt George Sports at gmail.com, but especially get loose and have some fun in the YouTube comment section down below. Before we wrap up, if you could do me a huge favor, Locked On Kings, believe it or not, has reached 1,500 episodes, 1,500 episodes of Locked On Kings as of this episode right now. It's such a tremendous, unbelievable accomplishment, and I'm so, so, so unbelievably thankful uh, for the ride, the journey. I have not been here the entire time, but nearly the entire time. It was, of course, started uh, by Jason Ross, uh, who is the uh, radio color commentator for the Sacramento Kings. And uh, he passed it over to me pretty early on and and trusted me with it. David Locke and the Locked On Podcast Network has trusted me with it. So to do the vast majority of the 1,500 episodes is just unbelievable. Uh, It's been a, a labor of love in a lot of ways. I always get people asking me, how in the world do you talk about the same team every single day? or most days, it's because I love this team, just like the fan base, just like the passion of Sacramento Kings fandom. And I'm very, very fortunate. I always tell people, 
I, while there are more people in Las Vegas or, or sorry, Los Angeles or more people in um, New York or whatever these ma major massive markets might be, you might get more eyes and more downloads and more of a following just because of the sheer, sheer volume of people. I succeed in Sacramento. The Locked on Kings podcast succeeds in Sacramento because this fan base is so dedicated and so loyal despite being put through hell until just recently that they continue to come around, continue to support, continue to listen. Uh, and I've been, I can't tell you how much I've benefited truly from that and from you and your support. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so incredibly much. Like I just, uh, it's, it's been a wonderful ride. I'm looking forward to 1500 plus more. We'll have before we know it, a 2000 episode celebration. Uh, so it's been incredible. If you can leave a review of the Locked on Kings podcast, that would help us out a ton. Best place to do that is on Apple Podcasts or formerly iTunes or maybe iTunes still exists. I don't know. But you can go there, hit five stars, leave a little uh, like custom review. It would be great if you could encourage others to listen to Locked on Kings or share what you like about Locked on Kings. But if you have constructive criticism for the podcast, hey, do it there as well. Uh, I appreciate you so much for doing that. Spotify listeners, there's no custom review system, but if you could hit uh, five stars on that. And then if you're watching uh, on YouTube, of course, you can subscribe, turn on the notification bell, just be active in the comment section uh, and share the episodes and keep watching as much as you possibly can. I really appreciate it. 1500 episodes. What an incredible ride. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And can't wait to, to do more, including 1501 coming up for you uh, here on the next episode of Locked on Kings. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to the Locked on Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.